I am a free to play player who is able to consistently clear end game content and even occasionally zero cycle a favorable MOC with allegedly mid tier characters like Blade. So is this just because of luck that I managed to build a strong account? Well not really. Luck definitely helps make things easier but a lot of it comes to patience and decision making. While my Genshin luck can be considered really good, my Star Rail luck has actually been very mediocre. I've won 6 50-50s and lost 5 on the character banner, and for the Lycone banner, I won twice and lost twice. And that's something that should have a 75-25 in my favor. And I rarely get early pulls, most of my pulls happen around 70-75 plus. So you can't even consider my Star Rail account lucky at all. So that's why I wanted to share some of the tips I've learned from over a year of playing this game free to play without incredible luck and give my advice to those looking to start the game fresh or those who are looking to fix their accounts without spending money. I'm also working on a new series where I take a brand new account towards the endgame, sharing every step of the journey. And the reason for this new account is to see what the new player experience is like and if my game knowledge can help me progress smoothly or not. And it's also an opportunity for me to build and try new characters I probably would have skipped on my main account due to limited resources. Anyways, I will be applying these same tips in that series. So if you're interested in seeing what it's like for an endgame player restarting from scratch, then stay tuned for those videos. I might even stream it, but I currently don't really have a stream set up. I weep for the departed. Tip number one, when the game finally allows you to add friends, try to add a whale as a friend. It makes your daily farming so much more quick and painless. Even on my main account where I have fully built characters, I still rely on my E6 whale friends to save time on my grind. My favorites are E6 Acheron for one wave fights and Argenti for really really quick Calyx clears. Expanding on the concept of using friends, add friends who have characters you're interested in but aren't sure about pulling. It's a great way to get a feel for how a character would fit with your current roster. For example, you can borrow a support character into the Echo of War to see how they would perform in a pretty difficult fight with other characters you already have built. And that's much more than doing a trial run. And also you can try characters even outside of their banner, like if it's a character due for a rerun, you can try them out if someone already has them, instead of waiting for the rerun to happen. Okay, number three. Avoid pulling early Eidolons on characters initially. I would wait until a rerun to see if you use a character enough to justify the Eidolon. The only potential exceptions might be Ron May E1 or Robin E1 as they are quite universal and will help whoever else you want to use, but even then I would probably save until a rerun or until you have proper teams built up. Because either you don't need the Ronmei E1, or even if you do get Ronmei E1 but don't have a second team built, you still can't clear the endgame content because it requires two functional teams. And then for DPS Eidolons, like, as always, they don't really... Okay, I'll put it this way. Unless you really decide to main a certain character, I don't think it's worth it. Just because DPS is the most replaceable role, you could always find a new DPS unit to replace your old one. It's the supports that are a little harder to replace. But even then, with the way the game's going, it seems like they're trying to make dedicated supports towards dedicated playstyles, and there's not as many universal best-in-slot supports. Like, it used to be someone like Ting Yun would be great on almost any character, but now there's characters like Acheron that don't really need energy. And characters like Ron, May, or Robin are pretty universal, but even then, sometimes they're not like the best character for a certain team. Like Ron, May is not the best choice for a follow-up team because now we have Robin. And Robin isn't the best choice in like a DOT team. So even then, there's no character that you need to pull for. And so that's why I don't recommend pulling Eidolons early, especially if you're free to play. It's only until like a rerun if you know that you're always going to be using this character. That's when I think it's worth investing into the Eidolons because that way you'll actually get value out of it. Okay, number four. 
consider saving your star glitter or whatever star rail calls it for at least one copy of Branya's light cone from the shop. If you already pulled a copy of Branya's light cone, then go ahead and trade them in for wishes because that's the only light cone from the shop that I think is worth getting at least one copy of. All the other light cones are, you can easily replace them with a four star weapon or a herd of light cone weapon. Number five. Avoid farming relics until Trailblaze level 60. You can definitely dip your toes here and there to get a set going, but I wouldn't burn all your Trailblaze power here. Use the relics you get from chests and level up rewards, and then spend your Trailblaze power on ascending your characters and ascending your light cones and maxing out your traces. Those are way more efficient pre-TL60 than relic farming. You can obviously dip your toes here and there to get like a set going, but early on your focus should be getting the guaranteed upgrades, right? Like until you're actually aiming for end game, end game, which I think starts around Trailblaze level 65, like that's when you should probably be considering end game content. I, I wouldn't spend too much time in the relic farming. Okay, number six kind of follows the same vein. You probably won't need to farm too many character XP or light cone XP just because if you focus on completing the story and all the old events which you can still complete you just won't get like the limited light cones or whatever that are attached to the event but all the other rewards are still there so if you complete the story all the side quests and all the events that would provide you with more than enough credits and XP that you don't really need to do any farming of the calyxes so these quests aren't just for the lore enjoyers. They're free materials and free stellar jades. And with how much new story content has come out since day one and all the past events, and the fact that these events are still available for rewards, you shouldn't ever really feel a shortage of XP or credits when building at least one to two teams. It's only when you start building more than that that you might need to start burning some trailblaze power on XP materials. But for now, while you're just building one to two teams, you should focus on spending your trailblaze power on trace materials, ascension materials, and your weekly echo of war. Okay, number seven. Focus on building one team at the beginning with one or two flex units. So that means at maximum six units total at the start of the game. Ideally, I would choose two DPS units with different typing, two support units, and two sustain units. The two DPS is recommended because sometimes you run into an enemy that's resistant to one type of damage, and so you ideally want to have a second DPS that you can sub in for those situations. You usually always want at least one support and one sustain on your team early on, and so your team would be a DPS, a support, and a sustain. The support is there to boost your damage, the sustain is there to keep you alive and the DPS is there to deal the damage. Depending on the situation, the fourth slot can be a second support to make your fights go faster. But if you find yourself dying too quickly, then you can instead run a second sustain unit. So you could have, for example, a healer and then a shielder. And then that would help you stay alive in the early fights because until you reach endgame, most of the early fights are not time gated, it's only the end game that's time gated. And so most of the early fights isn't about whether you can clear in a certain number of cycles, it's whether you can clear it while staying alive. That's why you can get away with two sustains early on instead of two supports or two DPS units on a team. And if you follow my recommendation of two DPS, two support and two sustain like that setup, then that lets you easily transition into having two ready-to-use teams once you do reach endgame content that requires two teams to function. So you'll be prepared for when you do need two teams. Number eight, when choosing who to pull for and build, obviously choose the characters you like and want to play since we play these games to have fun. However, you can't expect to just throw four characters you love together and call it a day unless you're super lucky and all the characters you love work perfectly together. For example, on my account, I wanted to main Blade because everything about him is so cool from his design to animations. And because of that, I chose to go for characters that I knew would make him better, like Branya and Sparkle and Ron May. 
if you wanted to play someone like Firefly or Boot Hill, for example, you may want to consider going for Ranmei because she's uh, she's like break effect centered. If you want to play Topaz or you manage to get a hands on a free doctor ratio and you enjoy using him, then Robin and Adventurine would be good pickups for you. If you like Kafka or Black Swan or you enjoy Nihility in general, you can consider getting both of them together in addition to Hua Hua or Akron or Ranmei. Uh, so a lot of it comes down to who do you like playing and then who are the best teammates for that character. And that should justify who you pull for early until you get that team going. Once you get that team going, then you can look for another character you enjoy playing and then look for the characters that support that one. And I, I think that's the best way to make your account shine because it's fun to have like all the characters you like. Like if I like playing Blade and I enjoy playing Firefly, for example, putting those two together wouldn't really be the most functional team. But if I know those are the two characters I love playing, then I can look for Blade centric supports and then Firefly centric supports and pull for those instead of continually pulling for other characters that I like and then having all of my characters feel like garbage because I never pulled the proper supports for them to shine. Number nine. This one also refers to my own content, but be careful blindly following guide content. Most guide content creators are doing their best to give you what they think is the right info, but these games can be incredibly complex with so many variables to consider, and everyone plays the game differently, so recommendations will vary depending on account status, playstyle preference, your relic rules, who you pulled for, who you lost your 50-50 to, and so on. There's nothing against guide makers. I used to watch them myself, and I still do watch some of them, but I realize that many times what they suggest is suboptimal for what I wanted to achieve. And that's also kind of why I started my own channel because I wanted to share my own thoughts on these games that sort of differ from what I hear from a lot of other creators. And most of these guide makers, they aren't really free to play. So they have a skewed perception of what actually is free to play. Because free to play basically just means not spending any money. It doesn't mean that you can only use four star characters. Like, someone can save for an entire year and then get an E6 S5 Acheron, and they're still free to play. Or someone can do a No Wish challenge and just have Wind Dawn Hung as their only DPS, and that's also free to play. The Zero Cycle community has this cost system where it's based on how many 5 stars you have, but even that's not perfect, unless I don't understand how it works. Because, like, they go by how many 5 star characters you have and how many light cones are used in that zero cycle run and that determines the cost. So if you have like an E1 S1, that's three costs because you have two five stars in the E1 and one five star in the S1. And then if the rest is all four stars, they would call that a three cost run. But then I would click into it and they would have two R5 dance 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 and like an E6 Ting Yun, which isn't really easy to get. Like it's so much easier to get an E1 S1 than it is to get like an E6 Ting Yun or an S5 dance dance dance. So like I, it, it's all relative. Someone might actually just have 20 dance 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 as a free to play, but lose every single 50-50. Someone else can get a double five star, but have no copies of dance dance dance. And then relics also, like if you have insanely cracked relics, does that count as a cost? If you have, if you have a 40 CV piece, does that count as one cost? If you have a wind set with 180 speed, does that count as like a two, three cost? Okay, I'm just ranting at this point, but like free to play is really hard to quantify. Everyone has a different account. Okay, I, I lost track of what I was talking about. Oh, content creators. Yeah, so my problem with the guide makers is a lot of the times they put out guides on character release using the information they gathered from the test server but then once the character gets opened up for everyone else to try, new ideas will come up and things that weren't mentioned in the guides that make the guide sort of obsolete. But then the guides wouldn't really get updated until the next rerun of the unit. And sometimes they don't ever get updated. So I just think while they put in so much work to get the initial guide as complete as they personally can at the time, new characters will come out, new ideas will come out. As more people test, there will be more 
brain power put into a character's theory crafting. And so things like what light cone is better, what Eidolon is better, what relic set is better, these all change very, very drastically on new relic releases, new light cone releases, new character releases. But the guides never get updated. So that's why I think it's really, really important to think for yourself sometimes. Use guides as a guideline, but not as a set rule. And cross-reference a lot. If there's a character you really enjoy, look for a dedicated main of that character. Since they probably tested everything that could be viable, and then they would know what works and what doesn't. Like someone who just kind of plays Blade will just say what most guide makers say, but someone who has built four different relic sets for Blade, use Blade in every single game mode, they'll have way different recommendations for you. So while I still really appreciate these guide makers, I sometimes still watch them. It's just I realize now that they aren't perfect and can get things wrong. Hell, even I get things wrong. Before I was able to build and use Gallagher, I really did underestimate him. I barely played break teams and I thought he was basically a weaker Luocha, but now I realize after building and using him, he actually is way better than Luocha in my opinion. Though in my defense, I don't think I ever called him bad, and I did say I never used him and so I wasn't sure of his placement, but after building and using him, I do agree, Gallagher can be very very strong. Okay, last one, number 10. You don't need to spend money on this game. There is no need to rush and finish endgame content. Take the game at your own pace. You're not missing out on much. Don't pull for a character just to try to get that one more star before Memory of Chaos resets. That extra 50 jades that you'll miss out on is not worth the thousands of stellar jades you'll spend pulling for a character you didn't really want in the first place. It's okay to sit on stellar jades and skip banners. You don't need to pull on every single banner. Also, light cone banners are not a scam in this game. It's something that you can actually consider as a free to play player. The rates in Star Rail are way better than Genshin. There's no epitomized path and your guarantee carries over. So if say you lose a 50 50 to the current banner light cone and then a new banner replaces it, your guarantee is still there for the next banner. So in that sense, Star Rail is a game where the weapon banner is not a scam and is actually something you could consider. It's actually easier to get light cones in Star Rail than characters. As for what light cones to go for, honestly it's up to you. DPS light cones can be decent upgrades over alternative options. It comes down to who you think you'll play for a long time. I will consider a light cone sort of like an Eidolon. So in my earlier tip about not pulling Eidolons until reruns, I would probably say hold off on a light cone until a character is rerun, unless you know for sure it's a character you plan to use for a long time right away. The other exception is pulling a light cone that is very universal, it can be used on anyone. For example, Jing Yuan's light cone is very good on other Your Edition characters, so I do know people who pulled specifically for that light cone but skipped Jing Yuan himself. So those were the 10 things I wanted to share after building up an account towards the Hyper Endgame as a free to play player. I will be sharing my journey on a second account where I start from scratch and use all the knowledge I've built up over the last year of playing Star Rail. And I'll be using characters that I have not built before and try to work my way towards completing all endgame content. This is not some sort of speed run to try to do this in like a month or anything, but I will be playing this at least until I 36 star memory of chaos and full clear of pure fiction or until I pull a Yanqing and then that's when I'll give up.